Thank you, David. <laughs> uh, I'm Jennifer Cook. I direct the Africa program here at CSIS. Um, and we're here today to talk about the uh, Nigerian elections that took place on uh, March 28th. Um, these were truly historic elections, uh, the most closely contestant, uh, contested in Nigeria's history, uh, an incumbent party which really uh, faced a coalition that held together, um, and the first time that there was really a real competition in which the sitting president risked losing. Um, it was an acrimonious campaign. Uh, rumors, accusations, uh, conspiracy theories, a really deep polarization along regional and uh, alarmingly, uh, in some cases, along religious lines, uh, I, I think left many people fearful about these, the outcome of these elections. Uh, elections have always been messy affairs in, in Nigeria. Um, last election in 2011, was a real step change in terms of the integrity and the credibility of their process. But still, uh, despite having kind of a, a fairly clear-cut winner, uh, those elections saw 800 Nigerians lose their lives in the aftermath, uh, including several of the young Youth Service Corps uh, members who are dedicated young university graduates who played such an important role um, and dedicated uh, role in those elections and these elections as well. Um, I think many here uh, in Washington and many in Nigeria feared that this would be a much, uh, because it was so much closer, uh, uh, overlaid with uh, insecurity in the Northeast and this deep uh, national polarization, uh, an amnesty in the oil producing Niger Delta that was coming to an end. I think many people feared that these elections would be even more violent uh, than the last ones. Uh, a major cloud of cynicism, I think, hung over Nigeria. Uh, many in Nigeria, but also here in Washington in the Western press, uh, really portrayed a government as you know, utterly without merit, a leader who would cling to power at all costs a postponement of the original date from February 14th was seen as a, a cynical ploy to manipulate uh, the, the polls to ensure victory. Um, and I think there was just a great deal of suspicion around, um, around the process and the eventual outcome. Uh, instead, as results came in and a victory uh, by the opposition seemed clear, we saw President Goodluck Jonathan uh, call his opponent, General Muhammadu Buhari, to offer a, a very gracious uh, congratulations and a public concession speech in which he declared to his followers uh, to take their grievances to the court, but to be proud of being a part of the party. It was not a loss for the party, but rather a sign of uh, maturation and uh, uh, democratic consolidation. I think Nigerians and the world gave a collective sigh of relief that the worst fears were not realized, uh, but also a celebration, I think, of parties on, on both sides, um, not necessarily for who won and lost, but really what, for, for what this meant in terms of Nigeria's political maturation and democratic consolidation. So this is a hugely important precedent in Nigeria's uh, democratic trajectory. Uh, it raises the bar of expectations for future leaders within Nigeria uh, and I think across Africa, given Nigeria's profound influence across the continent. <clears throat> I'm gonna to turn to our panel. Uh, all three are leading lights on Africans, uh, support for African democracies um, uh, and who have played instrumental roles in uh, the U.S. Uh, support for these elections, working with civil society, with the Electoral Commission. Uh, we have uh, Chris Vomunio, who I, I think everyone knows most of the people on this panel. Chris Vomunio, who is Senior Associate and Regional Director for uh, Central and West Africa at the National Democratic Institute. Uh, Gretchen Burkel, who is Regional Director for Africa at the International Republican Institute and Richard Klein, who is an uh, advisor for um, electoral processes at National Democratic Institute. Um, I'm, I'm gonna turn to them in a moment. I just wanted to make a, few, a couple of few additional points, if I might. <clears throat> and a couple of things that I, uh, just some of the themes I think that, 
that to my mind uh, made these elections very different. First was the change in expectations among the Nigerian electorate. Uh, and I think we saw this strong appetite for democracy. I had the uh, welcome experience of being an observer with NDI. Polls opened late. There were logistic problems. Uh, it was hot in some places, pouring rain in others. You saw voters waiting patiently th for polls to open for this fairly lengthy two-step accreditation and voting process for the card readers to work. You saw people sticking it out for some, sometimes up to 12 hours to cast their vote. Um, hugely patient, determined to vote, and you, know, you can't help but be inspired um, by uh, that determination. Um, civil society, I think, had a critical role in raising those expectations of, of what the process could offer them. Uh, in, in terms of voters knowing the process and knowing their rights, uh, in terms of uh, peacefully waiting, in terms of uh, understanding the process, and as I think Richard will uh, uh, explain, in adding confidence to the eventual results that were, um, that were tallied up. Technology also played an important role in these elections both uh, by civil society, and uh, again, Richard's gonna talk a little bit to that, but also for the Independent Electoral Commission, and many of the civil society efforts prior to the election in reaching out to an electorate on voter education, on uh, nonviolence messaging, and so forth. And finally, <clears throat> I do think um, institutions matter, but individuals also matter. Um, you know, first and foremost, some of the, the leading lights in Nigerian civil society, um, both the well-known and I think at the, at the local level among voters and so forth. Um, the electoral commissioner, Atahiru Jega, uh, inspired a certain confidence in the electoral commission, I think that was, has been critical in 2011 and, and this election as well, uh, in inspiring confidence in, in the institution and creating a culture within the institution uh, of integrity. He is unflappable, uh, he is not defensive, um, and he takes on board uh, uh, the issues and criticisms that throughout this fairly contentious election year. And finally, I do want to say a word for President Goodluck Jonathan, who I think, uh, you know, defied many people's expectations on this. Um, and uh, I think uh, in, in that one phone call, he has cemented a, a certain legacy in Nigeria in, in and in all of Africa um, that for whatever his detractors will say, I think he deserves a great deal of credit for. He was no doubt under tremendous pressure to, to uh, um, to hang on or look for openings, and I think it, we have to we have to uh, say that to his credit, he he didn't do that. Uh, these you know it's it's these are really positive elections. I have to say, I almost got choked up when the concession speech uh, when we when I heard of the concession telephone call. Um, on the other hand, it shouldn't obscure some of the many challenges uh, that happened with these elections, that were going into the gubernatorial elections, which risk, uh, in some cases, uh, some of the same problems, and of Nigeria as a whole. And we saw these, these rifts within Nigeria that for now, there's, the tension has been diffused, but those tensions, political, social, uh, regional still remain, and that's, we don't want to obscure that uh, today, um, but I think the success of these elections helps inspire and kind of motivate Nigerians and I think Nigeria's partners to, to work even harder on those rifts and tackling those challenges. So um, that's enough for me. I, I'll turn over to the real experts. What we thought we'd do is kind of take in, in two rounds of questions. So I'd like to turn to Chris and then Gretchen and then Richard to talk about kind of from your perspective and from NDI and IRI, what were some of the major concerns going into these elections? Um, what did you and your partners kind of prioritize in terms of doing to mitigate some of those risks? And how did those concerns play out uh, within the elections? And then in a second round, we'll look a little bit forward to the gubernatorial and beyond. Um, so Chris, why don't we turn to you first? And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh Jennifer, and um, 
I must say, first of all, how much uh, we appreciate, I mean, we as Nigeria Watchers and Friends of Nigeria, uh, appreciate the work that you and your colleagues here at CSIS, CSIS have done um, through all of nine, uh, 2014, uh, providing a platform uh, for very open, very informative discussions about the situation in Nigeria. I think we're all very thankful, and I must say that uh, a lot of those conversations did help inform uh, public opinion, especially here in Washington, on uh, ongoing developments in Nigeria. I must also say that uh, Nigeria did very well for itself and for the continent, and I think many of us are now left explaining to the rest of the world uh, why the narrative on Nigeria needs to change. Uh, not necessarily who was wrong and who was right in the predic uh, predictions in 2014, but more so what these elections mean for Nigeria and for Africa as a whole. And I think it's fair to say that we collectively probably need to revisit uh, what has happened and, and how that should impact how we see uh, democratic trends across the continent. In, in January, when I had the opportunity to testify before the um, Africa Subcommittee of the U.S. House, House of Representatives, uh, I quoted a very high-level, well-respected religious leader in Nigeria who told Gretchen and me when we visited with him in January of 2015, and I quote, he said, uh, we Nigerians have perfected the act of dancing on the brink, uh, but it is a very uncomfortable spot to be in. Um, and I did say uh, during that testimony that uh, I believe that Nigeria didn't have to dance on, dance on the brink uh, for forever or in perpetuity, and that I was optimistic that Nigeria would pull itself back from the brink. I think this was a very close call, uh, but Nigeria did pull itself back from the brink. Uh, going into these elections, uh, I had three things that I, I really worried about. My colleagues and I at NDI worried about the most. Uh, the first one was the Boko Haram phenomenon, the insurgency in the northeastern part of Nigeria, especially because uh, by the end of 2014, Boko Haram seemed to be at its peak. Also, Boko Haram, uh, which so far hadn't uh, openly declared its hostility to the electoral process, was beginning to make pronouncements indicating that it would disrupt the elections of February 14th. We were also worried that the Boko Haram phenomenon, especially in the northeastern part of the country, would affect uh, populations in the three states of Bono, Yobe, and Adamawa, and that that could lead to huge disenfranchisement of Nigerians, and that that could become a political issue if uh, those states were seen as the political base of one of the candidates, um, and uh, who could, if he lost in a close race, claim that his, uh, the voters uh, or voting had been suppressed in his areas of support, and therefore may be unwilling to uh, accept defeat. Uh, that is why uh, we also put a lot of emphasis at the time on uh, the possibility of internally displaced populations to vote, because at the time, the speculation was that there were, uh, that internally displaced persons in Nigeria counted in the millions. Uh, there were some statistics going from 300,000 to well over a million people, and we thought that was a significant number of people who did not have to be excluded from the electoral process. The second thing that uh, we worried about at NDI was the whole question of political violence. Um, violence mo motivated by competitive politics independently of the issue of Boko Haram and other concerns of insecurity. Because Nigeria has a past history of violence around elections. And because everyone described the 2015 elections as uh, very competitive, uh, that this could also uh, spark violence especially because the competitiveness was exacerbating pre-existing cleavages in Nigeria along regional lines, religious lines. Uh, we know that the incumbent was a Christian from the south, and his main uh, opposition was led by a Muslim from the north, uh, that these regional and religious uh, differences were being exacerbated by some of the rhetoric uh, that was coming out of Nigeria in the lead up to the elections. Thirdly, we also worried about the acceptance, the possibility of the acceptance of uh, election results. Uh, we know that both 
the PDP and the uh, APC had a lot of international consultants working on their campaigns. Uh, they had a lot of internal polls uh, for the candidates, and when we met with the candidates, uh, each camp had a sense of how well they would do in the elections. And we worried that if that was the message that each candidate or their campaign organization was communicating to their supporters, it would become extremely difficult uh, for their supporters to accept a different outcome, especially in a close race. And I think this uh, you know, a short list of the issues that concerned us at NDI, and that kind of influenced how we designed our support to the Nigerian electoral process, a two-pronged uh, approach which one focus on helping shine the light, the spotlight on these issues uh, by fielding international missions first in January when we, with IRI, had a joint pre-election mission to Nigeria that highlighted some of these issues press the Nigerian stakeholders on addressing these issues prior to the elections. And then further in March, uh, when uh, in early March, NDI issued a statement uh, that was co-signed by 14 world leaders, including Madeleine Albright, the chair of our board, um, a number of former African heads of states, well-respected, former president of Botswana, former president of uh, Mauritius, and former president of Cape Verde, the former Can Canadian prime minister, and other world leaders who had been on NDI delegations in the past, at a time when we feared that the elections may not hold even by March 28th, uh, because there was a lot of speculation that some of the reasons that may have motivated the postponement in February would be reactivated to postpone the elections a second time. And we felt that the Nigerian electorate didn't have the stomach or the appetite for another postponement, and it was important that international voices be brought to bear in that process. We also had a second uh, prone approach, which my colleague uh, Richard Klein will talk about, uh, which really zeroed in on building the technical capacity or providing technical assistance to our Nigerian uh, domestic uh, organizations, Nigerian partner organizations, to help them or help reinforce their contribution to the country organizing peaceful and credible elections. I probably would leave that at that to give an opportunity for my colleagues to also chime into the conversation. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you very much. And um, I do appreciate you bringing us together today to talk. I think it's important that we're having this conversation before Saturday's elections as well, because we need to keep the focus on events still to come. Um, there's still a lot of variables that could impact Saturday, and I think we'll talk about that later as well. This was my first time observing elections in Nigeria, and I have to say on election day, I was very taken aback with, uh, as Jennifer noted, some of the late starts and some of the problems with elections, ag the voting and accreditation process actually starting. But I was so, um, so surprised and so pleasantly surprised to see Nigerians self-organize themselves and remain patient throughout what was a very long day and often um, hot and things were a little bit tense at, at moments. But it was incredible to see, and I've observed elections around the world, many, many elections, but I have not seen such resilience in voters waiting in lines and really their commitment to the political process to really see this through to the very end. And so I think that is a real highlight for the people of Nigeria, and I was very happy to be witness to that. It was very exceptional. Um, as Chris mentioned, um, there were a few issues that uh, IRI looked at going into these elections, but also throughout the course of our work um, over the past several years in Nigeria. We did conduct um, a pre-election assessment in January, and that really, I think, crystallized some of the main issues for us. And that was confidence-building measures that um, the INEC and the political stakeholders had to undertake to ensure a smooth running process, and also the main issue of possibilities of violence and important messaging around peace. And um, as we look back through the work that IRI has done over the past year or two in advance of these elections, I think everything crystallized at um, that point 
and we saw some very positive results. And I, Jennifer, you wanted maybe a few examples of the kinds of activities that were undertaken around these efforts, and I'm happy to offer some of those. In terms of um, confidence building measures, um, IRI and many, many um, NGOs who are operating in Nigeria, including a lot of activities that NDI undertook, were very active in building support of civil society around the elections. IRI was able to do something called Manifesto Hour, which was a um, uh, radio show that aired for 13 weeks in advance of the elections that allowed political parties the opportunity to really talk about their platforms and messages, which is the first time really that parties were able to get out in front and do some of this. And that is a factor that underscores, I think, what we saw with political parties and really um, in this closely, most closely contested election in Nigeria's history, we saw a real development, I think, in um, the growth of political parties, and we're very happy to see that and some of their activities that they undertook. I would also hearken back to the um, political party code of conduct and the Inter-Party Advisory Committee, IPAC, which is something that IRI began working on way back in 2007. UNDP more recently has worked with it, but it became a um, point of communication between INEC and political parties. And I think that was a very important factor to ensure that political stakeholders were all on board with important messaging as well. And finally, there's the issue of political party agent training. IRI was able to train more than 15,000 political party poll watchers something that was highlighted in the 2011 elections as a, a necessary step to ensure that political parties and political party activists really um, felt that uh, there would be transparent and accountable elections. And we were very happy to see those large numbers come out as well. Around the important, the, the really the key issue here, I think, was the um, concern about violence and um, ways to prevent that and nonviolence measures. And there are some real highlights to point to. Um, first is, of course, the Abuja Accord signed on January 14 between 12 of the 14 presidential candidates. And that was um, something exceptional and I think something that really helped to um, dampen any um, potential uh, outbreaks of violence. Um, the uh, the, the germination of the Abuja Accords is something that we were able to point to in work that we had done on gubernatorial races as far back as 2011, when we worked with the Presidential Special Advisor on Inter and Intra-Party Affairs. And um, throughout this whole series of gubernatorial elections we saw since the 2011 elections, we were really able to see some efforts at the state level to bring parties together and start talking about these issues. And I think that's a very important example of some frameworks that were in place even before we got to the March 28, 11, uh, March 28 elections. And so I wanted to highlight that. There were also some extraordinary efforts around peace messaging, uh, around civil society that both NDI and IRI undertook. And one example is Dreams for Niger, a civil society campaign. Um, which really got out front on talking about the need for peaceful participation and nonviolent participation. And um, the, uh, both of us had worked with an organization, for example, called Young Stars Foundation as well. Jennifer, you mentioned the National Youth Service Corps and um, their efforts were remarkable. And I think a big takeaway from this election is the importance of A, involving youth, um, as early as possible in terms of getting out the vote and participating, and be um, finding productive things for them to do around elections. And the work of the National Youth Service Corps was exemplary. You had young people in their 20s who basically were running the elections. So it wasn't older party poll, it wasn't older um, commissioners running elections. Actually on election day, you had the National Youth Service Corps were the ones manning the polling box, counting the ballots, running the accreditation process, using the card readers. 
And that's something really exceptional to see, and I, I've never seen that anywhere else, um, that these uh, elections were run by young people. And it's an extraordinary example of the power of youth and the importance of keeping youth involved. And considering the stakes with uh, marginalization and um, the uh, tragic issues in the North, the absolute necessity of keeping youth active and engaged in a positive effort is essential. And we really saw this play out on election day. Yeah, not so much a PowerPoint as, as a few slides to illustrate um, some of the data coming out of these elections. And Jennifer, with your permission, I'm going to use a little bit more time now and a little less time later. I I'll feel that. Th th that's fine. <laughs> Jennifer knows I enjoy the sound of my own voice, and so we do have a time inconsistency problem here. Um, that uh, the approach I'm going to take is a little bit different. I'm here speaking really on behalf of uh, a, coalition, a coalition of over 400 civic groups in Nigeria called the Transition Monitoring Group that has monitored every election in uh, Nigeria uh, since 1998-99 and the, uh, the elections that brought an end to military rule in, uh, in uh, Nigeria for the 2015 presidential elections as they had done in 2011 and for the off-cycle gubernatorial elections, uh, TMG conducted uh, a quick count, also known as a parallel vote tabulation. Um, very simply, that involves deploying observers to a representative random sample of polling units. Um, what that allows you to do is two things, uh, and having them report back using coded text messages in near real time. What that allows you to do is two things. One is to provide the most accurate and timely information on the quality of the process. So during, on election day, they were getting reports from every single geopolitical zone, every single state, and in fact, every single one of the 774 local government areas, I think counties in the, in the United States. Um, uh, which dwarfed uh, the data, if you will, from any other observer mission. Um, the, the second thing is it allows you to do is because they are at a representative random sample of polling stations, you can add the results together from th those polling stations uh, and estimate what the official turnout should be. Um, right, the two should be consistent. If they are consistent, then people should have confidence in the official results. If they are not consistent, uh, then uh, one should has uh, empirical data to show how the results were manipulated. So the quick count or PVT takes a narrower focus than uh, Chris, uh, uh, Jennifer, or Gretchen were talking about, and so I'm going to talk about three issues in particular that TMG was concerned about on ele election day. One was uh, logistics. Uh, logistics have mired uh, Nigerian elections from well before uh, uh, Professor Jaga's tenure. Um, as people remember from 2011, uh, the first time they tried to have the National Assembly elections, those were canceled at noon, uh, and they had to try it again uh, a week later. Um, that for some of the off-cycle gubernatorial elections, the uh, logistics had been good, such as most recently Ocean and Ekati, um, but in some of them they had been abysmal, such as Anambra, where in two LGAs they were not able to conduct elections everywhere and had to reconduct the elections uh, a week later. Uh, the second issue was the introduction of the card reader, and I would say more broadly the introduction of the permanent voter regi uh, voter uh, uh, voters card and the new continuous voter registration process. Uh, for those of you who uh, think the word continuous means all the time, it does not. Continuous means periodic voter registration, right, just to be clear on that. But this was, the, if you will, the major innovation on the part of INEX uh, in terms of changing uh, uh, the, the procedures for the elections. I should have also said on the logistics front, INEC had set up these super centers in each of the wards to try to help with the logistics to overcome some of the challenges that they had experienced in the past. The third was that in Nigeria, as in many transitional societies, there is a real question about do the votes 
ref as do the results as announced reflect the votes cast at polling units? This is fundamentally a question about the collation process. Um, in most countries, the election has two, uh, three steps. In Nigeria, there are four. So first, there is accreditation, as Jennifer alluded to, which was in the morning, though most places it wasn't, wasn't. We'll come to that. Followed by voting, followed by counting. Those are parts of the process that people can observe directly. The part of the process that often in many African countries, and in fact most transitional societies around the world, that people are most concerned about is the collation process. This is the process by which the results are added together from all the polling units to determine the national result. Even if you put observers in the collation centers, you cannot actually confirm that the, right, the correct numbers are being used. It is a very opaque process, and unlike manipulation at a polling unit, which would take the involvement of thousands of people, you can manipulate the results during the coalition process by only one or two people being involved. Since one of the goals of manipulating an, uh, an election is that no one knows, obviously having fewer people involved, right, makes more sense, right? So let me very quickly try to look at those three questions, which is why I'm going to indulge uh, 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 using a little bit of more of my time now. So the first, as Jennifer alluded to, is this uh, event started much more on time than elections did in Nigeria, right? TMG observers reported that at 7.30 in the morning, which is when uh, polling officials were supposed to arrive at their polling unit with their materials, that it only 43% of polling units nationally had the polling officials and the materials arrived um, on time. By 11.30 in the morning, only 68% of polling units had opened. That was two and a half hours after the designated start time. So logistics were again a serious problem for, uh, for, uh, uh, for INEC. The second issue is about the card readers. That the, I'm gonna talk about that in two parts. First was there were real challenge, first the card readers did get out. Only 1% of polling units did not have the card reader. However, the card reader is a two-step process. The first part is that they put the, car, the permanent voter's uh, card into the card reader, and it needs to be able to read the card. Secondly, the voter is supposed to put a, a finger or thumb on the card reader so that it can read their fingerprint and verify that that is the actual owner of the, of the card, right, using biometric information. There's also a photo on the card, so there are other means of trying to verify that the, the person who has the card is the owner of the card, right? Um, at 24% of polling units across the country, um, that second feature uh, did not systematically work. At some polling units, it never worked. Uh, at other polling units, it worked uh, uh, intermittently. In some places, it worked the vast majority of time. Um, but at 24% of polling units, at some point, they were unable on that second phase for the, for the card reader to, to work. In addition, there were only 75% of the card readers worked at all points throughout the accreditation process. Right? At many polling units, card readers had to be replaced. At some point, they had to be somehow repaired, whatever that meant, um, right? And so there were challenges with the, with the card reader, um, though not as extreme as, as many people had thought. However, the TMG's findings suggest that uh, overall, while the process was delayed and while there were problems with the card reader, that set up accreditation, voting, and counting, as suggested by Jennifer, Chris, and, and Gretchen, largely followed the procedures and were credible. In about 5% of polling units across the country, they were unable to complete the process, um, but the overwhelming, and those 5% were disproportionately not in Northeast, as people were concerned, but were disproportionately in, in the South-South, which I'll return to in a moment. Um, but that overwhelmingly people were given, the Nigerians had an opportunity to participate in the process. Then the question comes about the accuracy of the results. Are the numbers that were announced 
by INEC did they actually reflect the ballots cast. As I said, up through counting, we had a, problem, a process that was, while having challenges in terms of delays and the functioning of the card reader, was generally credible. So the numbers that came out of the, um, oh, and sorry, just I want to give a shout out to Phil Brondike, who is in the audience. Um, he's going to be offended by the current slide, but Phil worked very hard with TMG to help them on uh, their uh, data visualizations. This slide is not from Phil. Um, <laughs> there's one other slide that is not from Phil. You will immediately know which one that is. Um, all the others were produced by Phil, who's in the audience, as well as the TMG staff working together. So this beautiful slide, um, and you can immediately see that I used the wrong font. Phil is very upset. The other font is not Helvetica. I'm sorry, right? So what we saw was that in Nigeria, one innovation that was done sort of on election night was the decision of INEC to announce results state by state. This had not been the plan. Um, in the past, they've announced all the results at one go. Um, there is a debate in the elections community whether it is better to re release results all at once uh, or little by little. Um, different countries do it differently. Uh, Zambia, those of you who followed the elections in January, they release results constituency by constituency. Um, other countries announce them all at once. Um, certainly my own personal position is transparency is a good thing. Getting those numbers out as quickly as possible is, it, it creates uh, confidence and it allows us to detect problems immediately. On Tuesday, they announced 19 of the 36 states plus FCT results. That uh, what TMG was able to do with the quick count data was state by state see did what was being announced consistent with the PVT or quick count data. I'm sure I'm way over my time. That, uh, right, that um, even though for an individual state the margins of error are quite large, for 18 of the first 19 states that were announced, the numbers matched. However, as you will see, a Quibom, which is at the bottom, this is in reverse alphabetical order, it took me hours to figure that out, um, that uh, a Quibom was the second to last state. And at that point, TMG had a lot of confidence in the results that were coming out from INEC. Um, and then a Quibom was announced uh, around midnight on Tuesday. And as you can see, these are turnout figures. The, the bar on the bottom shows the turnout according to the quick count. And the figure on the top is INEC's official number. There is a mass uh, d discrepancy between the two. Someone has put their finger on the scale and dramatically increased the turnout for a Quibom. This is particularly worrying because the South South voted over 95% for PDP. So increasing turnout will not affect the relative percentage of the parties, right? But it will dramatically increase the vote total for PDP from South South which then will have a, an effect on the overall national total. So this gave TMG considerable concern at that point about the, the coalition process. At this point, there were meetings between TMG and INEC and other stakeholders to bring this issue to people's attention. Over the course of the next day, all the other states matched in terms of the, the PVT data and the INEC officials, except for four states in, all in South-South. So uh, for Edo and for Cross River, as you can see, the figures match, but in four states, the turnout was dramatically increased, and because all of those states voted overwhelmingly, over 95%, for PDP, that dramatically increased the overall national vote total for PDP. And so what you see at the end of the day is that the, the results, in theory, there is the, the, um, the, uh, the lower bars are the quick count figures, and the dotted lines around them show the margin of error. 
the true result should have fallen within that box. Because the PVT da data, the quick count data, comes from the end of the counting process, and the TMG's data shows that up through the counting process, it was by and large a good process despite the delays and the challenges with the card reader. The official results do not match that. They do not match that, not because the official results are correct, but because they have been manipulated during the coalition phase by increasing the turnout, right, in South-South, in four states in South-South. However, what is important is that this did not change the overall outcome of the election. I'll return to this point when we, we have our, our second question. I'd like to say one last thing about, did, about the effect of the card readers. Did the card readers have their intended effect? That in 2011, turnout was suspiciously high, not only in South-South, but also in Southeast. If you look, turnout is dramatically higher in South-South in the 60s and Southeast than the rest of the country. Turnout is low in Southwest. People who have seen me speak before, I'll use the same joke. It's a good joke, right? There's no candidate who eats a mala, so people in Southwest, the Yorubas, don't vote, right? Until there's a candidate who eats a mala, that turnout figure is going to be low, right? The staple food of the Yoruba people, for those of you who don't find that funny, right? So, right, if we look then at this election, there was a dramatic decrease in the turnout in Southeast. Right, the green bars are turnout from 2011. The darker color are official numbers. The lighter color are PVT or quick count figures. So turnout collapsed in Southeast. They were, people were unable to put their finger on the scale in 2015, unlike 2011. And I'll come to why that was uh, in the second round of questions. However, in South-South, they were able to put their finger on the scale, right? But only in four states. So essentially, there were not enough states in 2015 where the results could be manipulated to flip the outcome. But what this also means in terms of the card reader, and I'm really gonna finish, Jennifer, that is in 2011, the PVT figures and the official figures match what that means is that the manipulation in 2011 in South, South, and Southeast did not occur during the coalition process. It happened during the voting and counting process in 2011. In 2015, the manipulation in South, Southeast did not occur at all. And in South, South, it did not occur during the voting and counting processes. It occurred during the coalition process. What that means is for all the challenges of the card reader, the PVC, and the, the continuous voter registration process, which became a huge political football in Nigeria, that that innovation moved manipulation. It didn't stop people from wanting to manipulate elections. I come from Illinois. People have heard this joke before, right? Four of our last five governors are in jail. We like to manipulate our elections, right? So it's not that it stops people from wanting to move, to, to manipulate the elections, but the card reader forced people to move where the manipulation occurred from the accreditation voting and counting process to the coalition process where it was exposed by the quick count. That was much too long, but hopefully useful to the audience. Thank you for indulging me, Jennifer. Um, maybe one, Question, when you say manipulation during the coalition, it's literally a question of, of changing the number on the forms. Because one of the accreditation, uh, one of the benefits of the accreditation voter process was that in any, any unit where the vote count was higher than those people that, registered, that were accredited by noon, the results would be canceled. So eventually, INEC would, would discover this, presumably, um, uh, on its own, uh, it's promised <clears throat> to, to uh, post 
results down to the polling level unit. So, I mean, quick count found it out earlier, but eventually would this have been caught within the system itself? Um, you're, you're stealing some of my thunder from the second part. I, I, I could, maybe it would be easiest to answer that as we look forward and what this means for INEC and for the, the, for the state elections, I think. Okay. If, but that's an excellent question. Well, let's look a little bit forward. And I've asked to think short term. We've got the gubernatorial elections coming up. Um, to Nigeria more broadly, um, uh, Atahiru Jega is not going to be there forever. In fact, he said he will be stepping down um, this year. Um, uh, and then perhaps reflect a little bit on what these mean and what lessons does this election, the new technologies and innovations, civil society hold for Africa more broadly. Um, so Chris, do you want to say a little on, on kind of immediate recommendations and then the longer term issues? Thanks, Jennifer. I think one of the benefits um, working on Nigeria while the INEC is, is being chaired by Professor Jega is that he's a very open chairman. Um, he's one of um, those rare chairmen on the continent who is very open to recommendations um, in 2011, he took to heart many of the recommendations that were made by both domestic and international observer delegations, and in 2015 has promised to also take a look at the recommendations that have been made thus far. Um, I realize that uh, Professor Jagger's tenure ends in June uh, of this year, uh, but there's also the possibility of that tenure being renewed. Uh, if I had a recommendation to make to the incoming government, um, it would be that uh, Jega's tenure be renewed so that he can see through some of the reforms that he's begun to institutionalize in the electoral process in Nigeria. Uh, we're all too familiar with, with sometimes the decision making in, in Nigeria, which sometimes is not the most rational in a way. Um, you don't want an election chairman to come in and start dismantling uh, everything that Jega has done in order to have his own uh, fingerprints or imprint on the electoral process in Nigeria. That would be one recommendation that could really help because I think all of the innovation that Jega has put in place in the last four years um, needs to be consolidated uh, such that by the time Nigeria goes through some of the state elections that would happen after 2015, because now there are about 12 states that would have staggered state elections, gubernatorial races between now and 2019, that will not be voting on April 11th, that by the time they go through all of those state elections, everyone in Nigeria would have become so familiar with the new technology around elections that by the time they come up to 2019, it would be an easy flow, uh, both for the poll workers as well as for the voters. Secondly, I think that the, the work that was done by TMG really zeroed in the focus on the problematic states in Nigeria. Um, River State is on that list. It's not by mistake. It's one of the states that has experienced the most violence uh, through this election cycle. Uh, I think the gubernatorial race in River State is going to be extremely competitive, and it will be helpful um, for the domestic groups and international observers to zero in on the states that have been identified as having uh, shortcomings. And the, the last thing I would say is just um, the youth. How does Nigeria leverage all of these young people who have participated in the political process? We were very gratified to know that Professor Jega was calling back some of the youth coppers who had worked on the 2011 elections. There are in the hundreds of thousands, close to 200,000. Uh, now there's a cadre of young Nigerians who have participated in helping build credible elections in their country, it will be important to see how the government invests in those young people going forward. Great. Well, we'll come back to you for broader um, African implications, since you've, you're going to be looking at a lot more uh, elections in this coming year. Um, Gretchen, do you want to talk a little bit about Sure, absolutely. And I, I did want to just briefly highlight some of the innovations and, and progress that INEC has made that Chris alluded to, um, because there were some, uh, some very important steps taken separate from the innovation with the card readers and the PVCs. 
but for example, a new communications policy that really saw a more active INEC outreach effort. And even when during our pre-election assessment mission, um, NDI and IRI highlighted this to INEC, even between January and March, they really upped that effort as well. So they've been extraordinarily responsive to input um, from stakeholders within Nigeria and from outside Nigeria as well. And I also wanted to highlight their new gender policy, which I think is exceptional to have uh, for, for INEC to have. And that was really, um, I think, a big step forward for uh, gender participation around the election. So we hope to see those innovations um, more fully implemented in the forthcoming gubernatorial process as well. Um, an issue that we need to now look forward to is how will all of this play out in the judicial system? Um, President Jonathan and um, PDP and others have said that they want to see any complaints and processes go through a judicial adju adjudication process through the courts. And um, that's fantastic. And now we have to really see if that is going to hold over the coming months as well. Um, just most immediately for Saturday, there is simmering tension in Rivers State. Uh, there have been issues there ongoing, and so that's, I think, where we need to keep our eye on for Saturday. And of course, the race, the gubernatorial race in Lagos is going to be fascinating. It's as closely contested as the presidential race was. And so I just wanted to highlight those two states as um, areas I think that will be interesting for us to watch for Saturday. I think I've already used all my time, but um, that uh, let me start where, with a point that you and Chris made, and then I'll answer your question directly. I mean, the, obviously the issue about Jaga's tenure is a, a, a critical one and not unique to, to Nigeria. Afari Jan is stepping down as the chair of the uh, Ghanaian Election Commission, just as Mambalima has already stepped down as the chair of the Zambian Election Commission. Those are all countries that have had very good elections, right? And the question, uh, and Jennifer, you alluded to this, the question is, is it yet about institutions in Africa, or is it still about uh, individuals? Um, Eric Postel, right, the Deputy Director for Africa at USAID wrote, I thought, a very good blog post about this, about this issue. Um, and that's what I think we will be seeing in the next, uh, in the next round of elections, that many countries in Africa have dramatically improved the conduct of their elections. I would say, and TMG would say, these were much better elections than, than 2011, despite all of their, their flaws, right? Um, but the question becomes, how much was that due to the choices made by individuals, and how much are those choices institutionalized that regardless of who is at the top of those institutions, that the same kinds of choices would be made? And that's what I think has to be watched over the, over the, uh, the, the coming years. Um, that as we go forward, a question on this election that, that you asked um, is that all of the all of this data was shared with uh, INEC on Tuesday night before the all of the PVT quick count data on here. Only a Quibom was was certified at that point. So INEC was aware of the discrepancy in a Quibom. You could actually hear people chuckle in the the ICC when they announced a Quibom. It was not a plausible figure given the turnout of the, all of the states that had come before that, including they had already announced, I want to say, three or possibly four states from southeast at that point. Um, the, the calculated risk that INEC took was that given the incredibly polarized situation in Nigeria, is it better to call out these states, right, or to make the judgment that there aren't enough votes that are going to be manipulated to change the outcome. And even though it is going to narrow and reduce Buhari's margin of victory, he should have won by at least 15%. And so while we all talk about the most contested election in Nigeria, and it, it's a hugely important election, right, and the, uh, the Afrobarometer and, and for clarity's sake, I was Mike Bratton's student, so anything I say with the, about the Afrobarometer, you have to take with a grain of salt. But the Afrobarometer called it a toss-up, right? But Buhari won, and he won massively, right? That, uh, 
that they made a calculated risk. Part of that, and this is why I, I talk about it, has to do with the federal nature of Nigeria, but also the federal nature of INEC itself. The, the SIEX, the State Independent Election Commissions, are not involved in these elections, but the state structures even within INEC itself continue to have remarkable autonomy. It is very difficult in the Nigerian system, in sharp contrast to, say, Ghana or Zambia that I just mentioned, for JEGA to refuse to accept the results from a state. And so while they did send a delegation to Rivers to, to investigate in uh, those numbers, because I don't think INEC trusts them, them themselves, or JEGA didn't. I should be very clear, JEGA and the people at the center of INEC didn't, that their ability to do anything about it was extremely limited as opposed to other countries. And so that, again, becomes a real issue of, of reform going forward. Two things about Saturday's elections. One, I would expect the logistics to be dramatically better than they were uh, a week and a half ago, I guess now. One, if you look at 2011, the pattern of, of delay in 2015 was almost identical to the pattern of delay in 2011. So uh, South South and Southeast were the last to open in 2015. They were the last to open uh, in, uh, in 2011 as well. Um, in 2011, there was a dramatic increase, each improvement in logistics each weekend. Secondly, I think people would have followed that uh, Professor Jaga talked about a problem with the uh, trade union uh, in terms of the delivery of the material. Certainly my view, I'm now not speaking on behalf of NDI, uh, but it is certainly shared by TMG, was that was due to political interference with the trade union um, to, delay the, uh, to delay the delivery of, of those materials. Um, and there will not be that issue uh, going forward. Um, what I am worried about is what the TMG data shows is that while the vote accreditation voting and counting processes have gone much better, right, that the coalition process is certainly, right, open to manipulation. There will be different political dynamics at play on Saturday about trying to influence those outcomes. Right? And so for, from our standpoint, we remain very concerned about the ability of, of people who feel, or fear that they are going to lose an election uh, because the states matter, the governorships matter, right? I think the, the final question, and I'm sure Chris and Gretchen and, and Jennifer will all uh, uh, touch on this, but I'm afraid Jennifer won't let me speak again, <laughs> is that the question will be, are we moving from a one-party dominant system dominated by PDP to a one-party dominant system dominated by APC, and that PDP is wiped out on uh, Saturday, and through defections following, right, like Zambia, right? So UNIP no longer exists, MMD now no longer exists. They got fewer votes uh, in January than spoiled votes, right? Um, that will that be the case in Nigeria, or will the power centers that the governorships create allow PDP to hang on in some ways? Because it's not very good for Nigeria to simply move from one party, uh, 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 one party dominant system with party A at the head and a, to a system with party B at the head, as opposed to being able to develop some sort of meaningful multi-party system. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Richard. And, and thanks, the audience, for being patient. Uh, we want to um, open up to you. We'll take a few questions at a time, since we, we've gone over a little bit. Uh, we'll go with Tony, uh, Deirdre, and then in the back. Uh, yes. Hi, Tony Carroll. I'm a senior associate here uh, at CSIS in the Africa program. Um, I have a question about the role of the media. Uh, not much comment about the role of the media. We were There were a lot of concerns about bought bought media as we've had in other panels here over the course of the last year. What, what was the play out with the media? Okay. Uh, Deirdre Lapin, University of Pennsylvania. Um, not very much has been said about the Peace Committee, although that backed up the Abuja Accord. I wondered if anyone on the panel would like to comment on the role it played. And also, perhaps in this connection, if there is a backstory to the concession telephone call that Jonathan made. 
Uh, there. Uh, Lawrence, <coughs> Lawrence Freeman, the director of the Africa Desk at uh, ER Magazine. Uh, I do like Jennifer was emotionally overwhelmed having followed Nigeria for 25 years to, to see this outcome. And uh, I think a lot of credit goes to the Nigerian people and also Professor Jaga. I mean, spending 48 hours to read each state out, every TV and every hotel in Nigeria and every home was watching that vote for two days. I think the question, though, that goes a little bit beyond what has been presented so far in terms of the future of Nigeria is the massive conditions of, of economic underdevelopment. I, I didn't stay at the Nikon Noga. I stayed at their friend's house, and uh, the electricity goes off several times a day. There's only 2,500 megawatts delivered. A massive unemployment, massive underemployment, misemployment of able-bodied young people in Nigeria. And when I had a chance to meet with the president-elect before I left, He's very much aware that the expectations are very high, and uh, my suggestion is something like a Roosevelt 100 Days program in infrastructure and development. I don't see this coming from the United States. I see this more coming from China and the BRIC countries, which are setting up banks for infrastructure development. I think this is something the U.S. has to take up if it wants to help Nigeria, is this uh, economic deficit in the country that will very much uh, be on people's minds, and I think was one of the reasons that Jonathan was defeated, that the frustration of just living each day is very great in Nigeria, and that has to change. And I wanted to know if people on the panel thought that we could get a change for economic development in Nigeria. Great, shall we um, st start with those? Um, on the media peace committee. Yeah, on the... Uh, on the media, I think one of the uh, issues we both IRI and NDI raised in January was the fact that the media was accused as being very biased and partisan and wasn't really helping um, contribute to a, a, a civil debate around issues. And I think that played itself out by the difficulties that the media community at large had trying to organize presidential debates that there was one initiative being led by the uh, Nigerian Television Authority, NTA, uh, which the opposition party didn't want to speak with because they thought uh, the NTA was very biased and as public media spent most of his time covering Jonathan. In fact, we had one of our observers who joked about the fact that uh, if you came into Abuja and just watched NTA, you would think there was a referendum. You wouldn't think there was another candidate in, in the race. Uh, on the other hand, there was another initiative being led by Channels TV, uh, which the PDP didn't want to be associated with because they thought Chanel was covering the opposition most of the time. Uh, interestingly, towards the end, in large part because of the Abuja Accord and all the calls for peace, the media towards the end played a very positive role. Uh, for example, the Friday before Election Day was declared National Peace Day, and all of the media outlets in Nigeria um, devoted airtime to talk about peace messaging. Um, it had a very calming effect on the overall environment. Um, with regards to Deirdre's question on the uh, NPC, the National uh, Nigerian Peace Council, uh, I did touch on that in my opening remarks. Uh, they, they played an incredibly powerful role. Uh, they're considered to have been the brains behind the Abuja Accords that were signed in January, uh, working in tandem with uh, the former Secretary General of the Commonwealth, uh, Emeka Anyaku, um, and this, this National Peace Committee is led by very credible Nigerians, uh, very well-respected Nigerians, uh, co-led by uh, former head of state Abubakar Abdul Salami, who is still very well-respected by both sides, um, as well as Commodore uh, Akimu, who was uh, vice president in the IBB, who served as vice president under the military regime of uh, General Ibrahim Babangida. Uh, it also has people in there, such as Senator Obi, who was a personal senior advisor to the president um, and therefore had a direct channel to President Jonathan. Um, it's, it's been stated in many circles that uh, as the returns were coming in, that the NPC was holding meetings and speaking to both sides, um, and that once it became clear that the uh, incumbent would lose, uh, that they went to the villa and had conversations with him as well. Um, just given the statue of people in the NPC, because it also had 
the highest religious leaders from both the Muslim community as well as the Christian community, that it carried a lot of weight and was being respected by the Nigerian people themselves. So I think this is also one example of something that could be replicated in other countries to create a buffer, uh, a neutral platform uh, where respected citizens or nationals of the country would go in and speak to both sides and carry some very powerful messages. I'll leave the other questions to my colleagues. Well, you know, just to add on the media front, um, as, as Chris mentioned, Tony, we had both NDI and IRA had hoped to do a series of debates and really felt like um, the environment wasn't going to be balanced enough, and so we really didn't move forward on that, which was a disappointment, I think, um, from the programmatic side of things. And then just simply on the National Peace Committee, it is my understanding, too, that they are going to continue to be very active, hopefully, moving forward around the gubernatorial um, elections, the forthcoming elections as well. And so, um, you know, that was just really an exceptional effort. And as, as Chris mentioned, really, I think um, a best lesson, a best practice that could be used in uh, the myriad of elections that are forthcoming on the continent over the next two years. And at the, at the polling unit that I, I was at where they count at the end, that it was, uh, when it was a PDP, people would say, continuity, continuity. And uh, when an APC ballot came up, change, change. So, you, uh, you know, I think they're going to need a, a, a little bit of both, in fact. Um, I think uh, the Buhari APC has not come out with real a concrete uh, implementation program on what it means by change, what it means by generating employment and so forth. I think to give uh, the Jonathan administration credit, they've had a pretty savvy financial team there that have, have done some important things in unbundling the power sector, in transportation, in, in the financial system, in agriculture and some of the distorting Im uh, import uh, subsidies there. Um, that I don't think the new administration will want to throw out entirely. People I've spoken to says that General Buhari has a much more statist uh, kind of the, yeah, the big developmental program approach, uh, perhaps less friendly to the private sector. Uh, I think a, a big a key will be who he surrounds himself with and who's advising him. And, you know, from what I hear, he's fairly open uh, to that as well. Um, I think you're going to need a balance. I think some of the things that the Jonathan administration has done on infrastructure and, and these reforms and so forth, they're not the kind of thing that immediately pays off uh, to the average citizen in, in terms of seeing immediate benefits. But some of them, if they're continued and implemented more fully, do kind of set the stage for broader-based growth, private sector investment, ultimately industri you, ha you have to have power for, for investment to come in and, and industrialization. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, think, uh, I, I think that's got to be one priority, kind of maintaining that while at the same time kind of accelerating some of that. The other thing I would like to see is greater linkages between the dynamism of the economy in the South and the northern economy, where agriculture and manufacturing have essentially collapsed, made worse by insecurity in the Northeast. And if there are ways to link um, the gas sector, the, the, the oil sector, and there's some promising things in fertilizer and so forth um, uh, that, can, that can make the two regions, if not love each other, at least depend on each other economically. And I think that's the big challenge for the next administration is both economic revitalization is one, getting over the regional polarization that has deepened so much in the last uh, year and that the campaign, even though it ended well, really fomented uh, some of that. Um, and getting back to that national consensus that Professor Ibrahim Gambari talked about when, when he was here, that really is at the core of democracy. And we, we talk a lot about the competitive nature of democracy, but at its core, there's this, there's this consensus that's needed. I know we're getting close to time. If there's just a couple more questions. Yes, uh, Philippe, yeah. if you can. Thank you for that great, great panel. Uh, Philippe DePonte, Eurasia Group. Just, a, I guess, a quick question that Richard alluded to, which is the future of the PDP, which nobody knows for sure, but assuming, let's say, if they do 
lose their, their majority of the, of the state houses too. You know, we're looking at a fairly weakened opposition here, and as you say, a prospect of someday of trading one, one party democracy for another. But, you know, we're not there just yet. What do you expect from the PDP, its ability and willingness to be truly obstructionist, or what its agenda might be going forward? Um, Sarah Aldridge with the State Department. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the voter turnout, and particularly how it was significant, or like about it was lower than 2011, and what um, influenced that, and whether it was just a, you know wrong numbers from 2011, or if there was noticeably lower turnout this time. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Saad Abdul I work for Evidence for Action here in Connecticut Avenue. Um, my question goes, uh, how do we improve, I mean, making sure that that manipulation does not happen at the coalition, once we are making forward with making sure that manipulation does not happen during the other processes of the election, uh, electoral process, and then secondly, how do we make it uh, much easier for the electorate during the electoral process that they don't spend so much time spending 12 hours, 13 hours, I had a message from a friend that voted at 1 a.m. from Yobe State, which is one of the Boko Haram states, and that potentiates uh, or exposes the electorate to potential attacks from the insurgents. So just is there a thought on how best we can collapse the processes and shorten the time of the election and making it much easier for the electorate? Thank you.
more trust, right? Because as long as they have to have these very draconian procedures to prevent illegal voting, it is also going to drive down legal voting. Thanks. And um, just to add that in terms of voter turnout, looking forward, what we have to start focusing on is youth participation and ensuring that um, not only Nigeria, but all African countries who are facing elections over the next few years really make efforts to get out the youth vote because um, those new generations are coming up, huge generations, the youth bulge in Africa. Uh, that's a key demographic that we need to ensure is going out to vote. And so I think in addition to, I like how you phrased it, Richard, you know, efforts at different levels to um, suppress um, bad voting, but also the system is so complicated it suppresses legal voting. That, that needs to be addressed as well, along with this youth, youth demographic, not only in Nigeria, but across the continent. And then in terms of PDP, I, you know, I, I hate to dodge it, but I just think the verdict is still out right now. So looking first maybe at um, uh, the National Assembly elections, for example, where, PD, or where APC has a clear majority, I think it's 214 to 125, and PDP is now going to have to um, learn how to operate in that new environment as a minority uh, to see how that plays out with them. And then secondly, around the gubernatorial elections, um, we're, we're, we have seen consistently now from March 28th a lot of um, um, uh, leaving parties and switching parties back and forth uh, to match the APC win. And that's sort of a natural outgrowth of wanting to be with the victorious party. But until we really see what the elections hold, we're, we might see some very powerful and important PDP governors no longer in seats. And, uh, these folks are going to need a place to go. Um, and so it, it will be interesting to watch, but I don't really have insight what's going to happen. President Jonathan hasn't said yet either sort of what he will do in terms of uh, party, party issues as well. Well, um, let me just uh, touch on a few points to, to wrap this up. The first is the NPC uh, just to mention that I sat in one of their uh, meeting sessions. Uh, they were kind enough to to open, uh, you know, to open their deliberations, part of their deliberations, to uh, representatives of some of the international delegations. Um, and I was pleased to see that Dangute is a member of the NPC. Um, for those of you who don't know him, he's the richest uh, African I can say, who's working hard for his money, um, <laughs> and. Because there are a number of others <laughs> who are not. But uh, for me, that was very uh, heartening to see that the private sector is at least having an, you know, an insight in some of these deliberations. There's now discussions about transforming the NPC into a permanent uh, organ or a permanent commission. And I believe some of the development partners, including UNDP, are looking at making resources available to make that a permanent institution that can even go into some of the um, disputes and flashpoints in the states to try to resolve disputes at, at that level. Um, I would also want to say that Buhari himself on Mr. Freeman's question, it was nice to see you in Abuja and to see you back here. Um, Buhari himself has said that there's enough money within the Nigerian system that if he could only clean up corruption, he will have something to work with in terms of economic development. I think since he made the fight against corruption one of his uh, priorities, if he, if he moves on that front, he may be able to garner the resources even within Nigeria uh, to address some of the economic development issues, especially in northern parts of, of the country. On PDP, um, I probably will step forward uh, further afield than, than my colleague Gresham to say that I think the PDP would survive. I would say that within the PDP right now, there are a number of powerful governors and powerful political leaders who believe, who are only waiting to get themselves ready to run against Buhari in four years. One of the things that these uh, 2015 elections have done for Nigeria is that it's really driven home the message that elections count and votes count. And that's going to galvanize people to be more invested in the political process. And I wouldn't be surprised if there are people within the PDP who are already trying to position themselves. Once they get a sense of what Jonathan wants to do next, uh, to first rebuild the PDP and then position themselves for 2019. Let's not forget that the APC today is also was built out of, you know, that the blocks that came together to constitute the APC had a lot of people 
who left the PDP because they were very unhappy with the way that Jonathan was running the party. Now, if somebody began a reconciliation process, some of those folks could go back, especially if they don't get anything substantial from being inside the P uh, APC. So I think the jury is still out, but I, I would be optimistic about Nigeria staying as a, a two-party system for the, the, you know, the uh, short to medium term. The third point I wanted to make was on the question that uh, Jennifer had asked earlier about what this means for Africa um, beyond Nigeria's borders. Uh, and I would say that I, I, in the past six months, we have seen a number of positive trends on the continent. You know, when people stand out in Burkina Faso um, and hold their ground against a 27-year-old, uh, a leader who has been in power for 27 years, uh, who came to power through a military coup, a military autocrat who has waived a lot of influence in the sub-region, and people came out in the Sahel in Burkina Faso and said no to Blaise Campari amending the constitution in October 2014. That was huge. We're now seeing similar debates about constitutional amendments with, with grassroots organizations and ordinary citizens saying no to their leaders in countries such as the DRC, in Burundi, in Congo Brazzaville, and I bet this is a debate that's going to continue. We saw recently activists from Senegal and Burkina Faso go to Goma in the Democratic Republic of Congo to support their colleagues who are advocating for greater political space in these countries. And I think what is happening in Nigeria is going to have a huge effect um, across, across the continent because people would say if the leader of Nigeria, and this is the first time it's happening in Nigerian history, if the leader of Nigeria would walk away from hanging on to power, how much more should they expect of other leaders in countries that are less endowed than Nigeria? I'm also hoping that there's um, an association of election administrators across Africa, um, and that uh, Professor Jager would take lessons from his experience with INEC into some of these meetings and would share with his Af African counterparts how he managed almost single-handedly to withstand all the pressures that he worked under to produce an election that the Nigerian people could be very proud of. And I think that peer-to-peer -peer communication cannot never be underestimated, and I'm counting on that to have some impact within the organ of election administrators ac across the continent. Um, there's also the question of leaders being able to accept results, election results. It was very, at one moment, it was very uh, heartening to see that the delegations, the, many of the delegations in Nigeria were headed by former African presidents. You had President John Kufo, former President John Kufo of Ghana heading the ECOWAS delegation, former President Emo Soya of Liberia heading the African Union delegation, former President Mulusi of Malawi uh, heading the Commonwealth delegation. Um, and uh, on the Monday evening, these three African leaders went to the villa, the state house, to have a conversation with Jonathan. And when they came out uh, in front of the cameras, they said, you know, we had a good conversation with the president, and we told him that uh, we're on our way out. We congratulated him and the Nigerian people, and we hoped that we wouldn't be asked to return for other reasons. That was a very strong message. And I think the more we see these kinds of messages being delivered by African presidents to incumbents, uh, the more likely the possibility that um, leaders will realize this life after the state house and you don't have to take your country down with you uh, when, your when your tenure expires. Um, that's also the fact that right now the continent is poised to have some very competitive elections. Um, as we speak, the, the, the elections coming up in Burundi, um, in in, in, in Burundi, where the, the issue of whether the incumbent should have another term is still out for dispute, and we have people even within the ruling party saying the, the president who has served 10 years as per the Arusha Accords should not be allowed to, uh, to contest for another mandate. Uh, we also have elections coming up in Togo, in Burkina Faso, in Cote d'Ivoire, and in Guinea. Uh, and some of these um, uh, in countries, some of these elections will be taking place in countries where political discourse is still very polarized. And I think that um, people will be looking at what transpired in Nigeria uh, all the way from the political leadership to grassroots organizations and finding ways to make sure that the momentum for credible uh, elections in Africa can be maintained. 
Uh, let me just make one last pitch for public diplomacy, something that we haven't talked about yet, um, and the role that public diplomacy played in the Nigerian elections. Obviously, the credit for what happened in Nigeria goes to the Nigerian people first and foremost. But I think this was one case where there seemed to be consensus within the international community that Nigeria was important and that Nigerian elections were important. Um, that explains why groups such as IRI, NDI, IFES, um, and other organizations funded by uh, the USG uh, have been in Nigeria all these years, working side by side with Nigerians to try to provide technical assistance and support and solidarity as they gone through these electoral processes. Uh, I got an email from a former NDI colleague who now works for the USG who said, you know, this has been a, a contribution over a generation, and he feels like he also made his uh, contribution over 10 years ago. I think it's a long, it's an ongoing process, and the tenacity with which this support is provided in countries, in transition environments, really makes a difference. I think Nigeria is one example that we can't go into countries on a one-shot basis and expect to see results. There has to be a constant support for democratic governance across Africa. And if that's, that support doesn't only have to be in rhetorical terms, it really has to be in terms of putting the muscle to the effort so that in these countries, people can feel the impact of the contribution that's being made. In the Nigerian case, it was very uh, heartening to see uh, Secretary of State Kerry go to Lagos very early on when there were concerns about the elections holding in February 14th, and to meet with the two candidates and to have very frank conversations, because I think those conversations transmitted some messages, but they also opened channels to these leaders to realize that the world was watching. And that was followed uh, not too long after by the joint letter signed by Secretary Kerry and the British uh, Foreign Minister. Um, and then the phone call that came from Vice President Biden while we were already in Abuja in the trenches, calling for peaceful elections and re-emphasizing the need for the use of the card readers, because even as we inch, uh, we inch towards the elections, there were still pockets of resistance to this new technology within Nigerian society, and fears that some of these people who were resistant to the use of new technologies could undermine the process. And so when it was reported in the Nigerian papers that Vice President Joe Biden had called and expressed his support to INEC and the use of card readers, he had a very positive effect. And obviously the uh, videotape uh, message that President Barack Obama sent to the Nigerian people, uh, you know, was very well received and it got a lot of positive reviews. I remember on election day being at a polling site uh, with um, former Assistant Secretary Johnny Carson and, and Vivian Derrick and the former governor of uh, Colorado, Bill Reader. And then we, a car pulls up and here comes uh, former uh, Nigerian head of state, uh, General Gawan, Yakubu Gawan. So he comes out of the car and we engage in a conversation. And I asked him whether he heard the videotape message from President Barack Obama. He said, of course, I heard it. And many people have called me to congratulate me because President Obama used my sentence when he said, to keep Nigeria one is a task that must be done. <laughs> For those of you who followed Nigeria in the Civil War years, that was uh, the opening message from Yakubu Gawan every time he came on TV. He said, uh, to keep Nigeria one is a task that must be done. So I just you know, cite these examples to say, Public diplomacy had its contribution, and uh, the work that is being done by organizations such as NDI, RRI, IFES, Search for Common Ground, um, and many other organizations funded by the U.S. taxpayers has an, its impact. And Nigeria is one case that we can all celebrate collectively as a success story. But my hope is that as other African countries come up to, come up to this electoral calendar uh, with very competitive elections, that we will continue to pay the same amount of attention that we've paid to Nigeria. Because ultimately, the big countries, such as Nigeria, impact the small countries. But we've also seen, especially on the African continent, cases where the small countries, such as Benin, and Botswana, and Liberia, and, and Zambia, and Ghana, and Mauritius, have impacted big countries. And I think that in 2015 and 2016, uh, we all will be called to provide as much assistance as possible to those countries as well. Great. Well, wrap up. Um, I want to thank all three of you um, for the work you've done and for coming today to explain a little bit uh, about that. Uh, 
the CSIS Nigeria election forum will probably have one or two more sessions, and I think the next one will really start to look forward at um, that bigger, those bigger political questions of uh, keeping Nigeria one, getting past the winner-take-all nature of Nigerian politics, and uh, that we no, didn't discuss the money factor in Nigerian politics. Um, but uh, we're going to be looking forward to what comes out of the gubernatorial, uh, and we'll be staying in touch with you um, on Nigeria for a while to come. So thank you very much to Richard, Gretchen, and Chris, and to all of you for joining. Thanks. Thank you.